Irina encara com naturalidade desafios como programar softwares e escalar montanhas rochosas. Além de desenvolvedora e alpinista, ela é mentora de código em Vancouver, no Canadá, onde vive atualmente. Em sua palestra na Brasil JS 2016, a entusiasta do JavaScript mostra como é possível treinar autômatos celulares para evoluir geneticamente. Tudo claro com base na sua linguagem de programação predileta, o JS. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Irina, and today I'll be talking about JavaScript and cellular automata and one of my favorite subjects out there. Um, so, hey, um, it's awesome. I'm Irina, like I said before, I am um, Irina with L's on Twitter because uh, somebody else has Irina and doesn't use the Twitter account, so that's me. Um, I am a software developer lead, um, or development team lead, or fancy titles, at Small Media Foundation. Um, I am based out of London. I used to be in Vancouver in Canada, so I just decided to move oceans. Um, we do um, research and development and innovation with human rights organizations in the Middle East, and that's um, kind of what I do during my day job. But today, um, I'll be talking about my night job, which is like experimenting with interesting things or doing research and other interesting things. And so today it's about cellular automata. Um, all right. So genetically evolving cellular automata. That sounds really kind of confusing. Um, I mean, like, like where, where do you go? Like, what's happening? Um, so how did I get it? How did I even get into this? Um, so a good thing to do is let's start it with a story. I'm a big fan of stories and how things get to where they are. Um, so let's start with the story. Like I said, I, I lived in Vancouver for a very long time and Vancouver is just full of rain. Um, I didn't make a very good life choice. I moved to a city that's also full of rain. Um, so this story comes from the fact that um, I was, uh, I'm a pretty outdoorsy person. I go out on hikes pretty often. So this was November. It was pouring rain, and I decided to go for a hike to the mountains in pouring rain. Um, and on my way there, I went to the library, and the library had this super awesome book sale. Um, and one of their books were $2, which is probably, I don't, I don't know, maybe five rea. Is that, am I pronouncing that right? Probably not. <laughs> Um, so one of those books was $2, um, and so um, I was looking at um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I thought that was an awesome book to buy, and the person I was with um, picked out this really interesting book um, called Complexity, A Guided Tour, and I thought that was a really awesome title, and I flipped through it, and a lot of it was just about kind of what is complexity? How does it get there? It started with ant colonies and, and went on to talk about machines and computers and a concept of cellular automata, um, which is a discrete model in computational math. Um, and I thought that was a fascinating subject and I wanted to see whether I would be able to take it on and kind of explore that particular subject. So I got coding um, and I came up with something that uh, Melanie Mitchell, who's the author of the book, um, that she was talking about and a bunch of other mathematicians were talking about. Um, and so I created this and that was super exciting for me. Um, <laughs> it was super exciting for me, so I thought, let's talk about this or let's talk about what is cellular automata. Um, let's talk about cellular automata. Um, the initial concept, um, kind of the, the person who c came up with this concept was John van Neumann. Um, he is known for a bunch of very various uh, things and less infamous one is probably the Manhattan Project. But aside from working in physics and things like that, he was also very known for his mathematical theories. And um, during later stages in his life, he um, came up with a theory of self-evolving cellular automata. And that was one of his later works. And so he talked about what if we have this automata and what if it self-evolves and what comes out of that. And so he mentions two kinds of these automata, um, one being artificial, uh, 
so our computers, and two, being natural. Um, there's a bunch of these kinds of patterns um, present in seashells, like conus and symbiola seashells. It's kind of interesting. So today we'll be talking, obviously, about computers, even though seashells is also a very interesting subject. So we kind of want to know more. Um, let's talk about what constitutes a cellular automata um, and what, does, what makes up of it. Um, I think the best way to describe it is kind of what are the, what are the traits that automata takes on. Um, and there's kind of four main ones. Uh, one is that the fact that whatever the final product is, um, it's very dependent on how you define its parts. And its parts are basically the rules um, that automata follows. Um, so the result, or whatever we comes up with at the end, is dependent on how we, what are the rules that we define. Um, another thing that von Neumann put together is said that whatever it is that I am, um, as an automata, I must be aware of what's happening around me, and I have to have this awareness of myself and m my parts around me as an automata. Um, so I have to know all the things. Um, and the fact that whatever the automata does, it doesn't, um, it doesn't do it to itself, it does it uh, to something else. Um, so it's, it's, the operations are not directed them, at themselves. And the main part is the fact that it's decentralized. So it's not a central system that controls it. It's uh, the parts that we defined initially. And what it leads to, these kind of four different sets, it, it leads to a, um, a much more complicated object um, that comes from very uncomplicated parts. And kind of the, the, um, the main example of this is the Turing machine which came before uh, von Neumann put his paper on self-evolving at automata. And what the Turing machine is, is um, you have an automaton that produces an action. Um, automaton directs its action not to itself. So the automaton would be um, the hole puncher of the Turing machine, the one that punches the holes. So it directs the action obviously not to the puncher, but to its tape. And the tape is the final product. So what the t final product is, is something completely different. So the hole puncher is just gonna punch the holes. That's its only action. Um, uh, the tape is the result. So the punching is very simple. It's very kind of binary, right? It's, you either punch a hole or you don't punch the hole. Um, but the tape itself is completely different. So you're producing completely different constructs. Um, and what the Turing machine did um, was initially solve enigma codes, right? Um, so it produces a much more complicated object from just holes, from just punching holes. So much more complicated um, construct, which I also thought was super fascinating to me as part of this kind of research. So basically what happens is that computation emerges from these particular rules that the automaton follows, like punching the holes, um, by each individual automaton, the hole puncher. Um, so, and why this was so interesting to people is um, working um, as a decentralized, um, spatially extended systems, um, it produces a natural system and it models a natural system and that's why so many people are interested into it, in it. Um, so let's go back to trait number two, um, awareness, and let's actually look at von Neumann's automaton. So when he... Um, when he put it together, um, it was literal light bulbs. I'm using emoji, I don't have literal light bulbs. But it was literal light bulbs connected to each other with wires. And what they would be doing is looking at its connecting light bulbs and seeing, okay, um, is the connecting light bulb on or off? So that comes in from that awareness portion of it. Um, is the light bulb on or off? And I'm going to do something based on the fact whether or not my neighbors are on or off. Um, so that was kind of the the original automaton that he put together. Um, and it was a grid. It was basically a grid, just like this grid. Um, so then uh, something that most people or some people might be familiar with is Conway's Game of Life. Um, and that's a replica of what the original automaton was, but it was obviously computerized at this point. Um, so what, what you end up with is um, you as the koala. I like koalas. Um, I like wombats, but this is the only emoji that's as close to a wombat. Um, so you are the koala, 
And um, you want to know what your neighbors are doing. Your neighbors are turtles. Um, and you want to find out whether or not you want to be a koala or a turtle. Um, so to, if you're a koala and you have three turtles around you, you become a turtle. And then if, um, if you're a turtle and two or three turtles are around you, you stay as a turtle. Um, and if you're a turtle and there are two or less of you, um, then you become a koala. And that's kind of how you switch. But you have to know what's around you. So you are the koala and everything around you is, um, how your behavior changes or how your behavior changes. So, um, Again, you're, there's only two states. You're either koala or turtle, and that's kind of the beauty of it, is that your rules are based on the two states, kind of binary, in a way. Okay, so this is a kind of a, a cell with cells around you, but um, it becomes really interesting when you have a much larger grid. So it's not just you as a cell and the, um, the eight or nine cells around you. Um, it becomes more interesting when you have a larger grid. So there's a couple of different examples of this. There's the glider, um, that over time um, you change cells based on the particular rules of whether or not you're a koala or a turtle or you're black or white. Um, or there's even more complicated parts when your grid is even much larger than that. You look at like a blaster. So this is basically your t two states, you're black or, or white. Or, um, and then over time, you're going to change. Okay. So this Conway's game of life is what's called a two-dimensional and binary automata. So you, you're you working with two dimensions. You're, you're aware of everybody around you. And you work with time, so two dimensions. Um, there's something else called the um, elementary cellular automata. And somebody else came along and is like, I just want to simplify this. This is too complicated. I don't want to know what else is around me. I just want to keep it to a one-dimensional state. So that means that you're a koala, and you care about just the two turtles around you. That's all. So let's take a look at this a little bit more into detail. Um, you start into one dimension. You have one dimension of just koalas and turtles. You care about the two neighbors. And over time, you're going to make decisions based on your neighbors and just reproduce yourself over time. Um, so you're going to look to the right and to the left. And then based on what your siblings are, you're going to change. Um, you're going to change based on the rules that you've defined. So it could be, uh, there's 256 of these um, different rules that Wolfram came up with. Um, this one was based on rule 110. Um, and so you, you're basically going to change based on what your two neighbors are. Um, and kind of the, the automata itself is basically just an array of um, different objects. And each object is based on your state, which is a koala or a turtle or true or false. And then your two neighbors, so your left neighbor and your right neighbor. And they're also true or false, whether they're koala or turtle. So that creates a pattern. So let's look at the actual pattern. So I built this out. This is kind of a very, a very simple example. And this is rule 110 that Wolfram came up with. And what's fascinating about this is that, is that, again, you're following just the two simple rules. You're either on or off, you're a koala or a turtle. And what comes up is kind of these, these patterns that are just unexplainable by the fact that you're on, only doing this based on the fact of whether or not your neighbors are on or off, or be, whether your neighbors are koalas or turtles. And that's what I thought was super fascinating to me. So I went on and looked some more. And what happens is that different kind of patterns dominate that particular automata. So if you notice, there was particular triangles that would just go down. Um, and that's what's fascinating. So then 
again, certain patterns, patterns will dominate. Um, a set of con and a pattern is basically a set of configurations that share a common spatial structure. And in particular, with this rule 110, it's triangles um, and triangles that go down. And every time you kind of, like, I guess with that page, every time you refresh, you'll get a different set of um, patterns. And they will never reproduce itself. You'll never get, an, get the same pattern. Or it's very difficult to get the same pattern, basically. Um, and then what the discovery was is that these uh, spatial temporal behaviors um, where system organizes itself into patterns. And so basically these particular triangles that will go down organize themselves and it's not the system, it's not these rules that organize them. And again, like itself into patterns and it does it on its own without a central, it's decentralized. And again, decentralized organizes itself, which is really interesting to me. <laughs> um, and so this brings me to like this a little bit of, um, derailing is this theory of it from bit. Um, and what it from bit is, is basically meaning that a bunch of, um, there's a long, longish quote about it, but I guess I won't read it out. Um, what's the basis of that is that so many th things in, um, in the world are based on binary states or decisions could be made based on binary states. And it's, it's fascinating. So, organizes itself into patterns, which brings us down to complex system because you have something that's very simple that organizes itself into a much more complex system that can be reproduced or can be um, com computed, I guess, in a way. Um, so the, so many mathematicians and computational folk that work on this um, try been trying to define complex system, and none of them agree. It's like, De JavaScript developers can't agree on what kind of framework to use. It's the same thing. Nobody has the same answer. So, um, what uh, one of the th one of the kind of ways to answer this is to look at um, three questions and try to answer these questions to be able to define a complex system. One is how hard is it to describe the system? Um, how hard is it to create the system? And what is the degree of the um, what is the degree of this organization? So how does the system itself organize this? Um, and there's one answer that uh, Melanie Mitchell um, came up with in her book was the fact that um, we want to see what the average information or amount of surprise is. So with those, with Wolfram's rule 110, we're quite surprised as to what comes out of it because all you're doing is looking at your neighbors. Um, and another definition or kind of another answer is a uh, complex system is in fact um, how how much um, or how quickly will it take you or this what's the size of the shortest program that could generate a complete description of whatever is your result so it would take you quite a while to reproduce rules rule 110 the the, the size of the program is just going to be a lot larger than something that will is specifically on off on off on off on off on off um, and that's why so many people are quite interested with it um, and so which brings me down to genetic algorithms and cellular automata um, because such a system simple system produces um, such a complex result. Um, a lot of people have been looking at these as kind of models that could be worked on further on and developed into kind of into rep trying to reproduce these and see what kind of results they get. Um, and one dimensional and two dimensional automata have been looked at to work with kind of density classification into synchronization and random number generations and things like that. And um, I kind of liked the concept of density classification as um, as a genetic algorithm. It's really simple, it's, it, or it's more or less straightforward. Um, it can be used on anything but density classification, so there's nothing like super interesting with what you can do with the result. But it's interesting to look at as kind of like the simple model to eventually do something else. Um, so what happens is that you have a new set that is generated from each generation, so you have a generation, a lattice, or an array of koalas and turtles. Um, and what you do then is that you produce, um, or you perform a fitness level test. So you take all those cells, all those generations for a run, and see which one performs better. 
And then you sort them in order of fitness. And then what you want to do is when it's, you want to take the best 20 um, out of that fitness test. So you just like line them up, get them for a run, grab the best 20. And then the um, and then you construct a new generation out of that best 20. And then the rest eight, uh, the rest 80% of the cells um, is are basically crossovers between um, those 20%. So because the 20 are the bestest, um, and you want to keep the bestest um, in your system, um, and you randomly select kind of parents from those 20%. And so <laughs> the results are basically you come up with like a blank screen on generation zero. Um, there is the first lattice will be randomly generated and nothing else happens. But in later generations, you're able to see kind of interesting patterns Im emerge. So you're able to see in generation eight, you're kind of looking at something a little bit better. Generation 13, probably something better and so on and so forth. Um, and something, so I guess this is kind of one dimensional lattice, as I was saying, because you start off with first level cells and then this time goes on, you produce something else over and over and over again. Um, but something that's interesting that's been happening is looking at a two-dimensional cell and using it as image processing. Um, and kind of explaining the concept is that, again, you're going back to um, Neumann's original automaton or Conway's uh, Game of Life automaton. Um, and you're looking at all the cells around you. Um, not just the one-dimensional lattice. And then what you basically have is um, the same array or the same array of objects um, that are basically your cells, and you're recording um, what you are and what are your neighbors and kind of what's their state and going from there. Um, and then looking as to... So what you're then doing is then saying, okay, I have a certain set of input, and I'm going to push it through the automata, and I'm going to get an output and get this automata to reproduce a cell. And that's where people have been taking this kind of approach with a two-dimensional lattice rather than this one-dimensional automata. And that's kind of like the interesting stuff. Okay. So I guess in conclusion, <laughs> um, it's it, automata are a really interesting concept to me. And why they are so is because they're relatively simple to understand or when they work together, it's a relatively simple breakdown of some of the more complicated concepts that we use in everyday life, like your kernel. This is basically like a simple representation of what your kernel is like. Um, and then kind of getting other things to come out out of the simple representation is really interesting. Um, so I've put together a list of resources that I've read. They're kind of in my, uh, in order, in a very biased order of what I enjoyed reading most. Um, some of them are just like computational theories, but that's cool too. Um, I'll post slides online and I'll tweet them. Um, and thank you so much for listening and for having me. Thank you.